You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 on Instagram and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Welcome to the Lawyer Stories podcast with Benny Gold. Uh, Today we welcome Paul Malice Esquire, senior partner at Young Mar Malice and Associates, focusing on criminal defense in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area. Paul, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks for having me tonight. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. Glad to finally uh, do this podcast, this episode. Yeah. You got a lot of cool things to say. You know, I appreciated your story and your email. We just featured you recently. So first off, just tell us where you're from. Are you a Philly person? Yep. So I'm from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Uh, It's about, I don't know, 15 miles outside of the city um, and born and raised in that area. That's awesome. So we we recently featured you on lawyer stories, lawyer underscore stories on Instagram, and it went on uh, it went on LinkedIn, it went on Facebook, and you know one thing I, I got from your lawyer story really quick was you were you know you were uh, totally intentional it said and not by mistake from a young age you knew you were a lawyer you know like you were really gung ho lawyer from the beginning of your lawyer story so I was hoping you could like tell us a little bit about that you were saying you're a lawyer from a young age. Sure. So everyone told me, family, friends, that I was going to be a a great litigator. I was good at speaking and I was really good at arguing. Um, And ever since growing up, it always used to be like, oh, I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to be a lawyer. And that's just the trajectory that I'll be on. And then it it finally became like a reality as I was kind of going through the motions of applying to colleges, going through uh, my undergraduate degree, and then, you know, then applying to law schools, taking the LSATs, getting into law school, and then graduating law school, and then taking the bar exam, and then boom, I had passed, and I had actually become a lawyer, and yeah. it was, it was, it was amazing, but, but it was like my dream had actually come true. And so, you know, it's interesting, because usually I ask people, like, what was that moment? Did you have a moment? Some people don't have a moment. They're like, okay, I'm just going to go to law school. Other people are like, whoa like that life circumstance, like led me to be a lawyer. You were, you just sort of knew it from the beginning. You were like gung ho lawyer. I, I knew it from the beginning. Um, fortunately, I had two great parents to kind of guide me in the right direction. Um, I, my dad is a doctor. Um, I just, I had that guidance and, and, you know, I watched my cousin Vinny growing up and I watched, you know, other, yeah. other types of, uh, other types of lawyer movies sure. growing up. And I was like, wow, I really want to do this. I want to be in a courtroom. So yeah, that's a great, that was my, that's a great movie. Phenomenal. Doesn't he say the word Utes? The Utes. He said these these two Utes. These two two what? Yeah. (laughs) So, all right. So what was your law school experience like? I mean, I could sit here and tell you about mine, but nobody wants to hear that anymore. Um, (laughs) what, What about, uh, what about yours? What would you say? Like, you were so gung ho being an attorney. You get to law school. Like, was it everything cracked up to what you thought it would be? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's that's a fair question. It it, it was almost I want to say an extension of I would would have liked it to be like an extension of my undergrad um, experience at Penn State, um, but it was like way more intense. Um, yeah. There was one exam. You, I mean, you had. You have a 15 week term, they call them terms, not semesters. And weeks one through 13, new information, week by week by week. Week 14, you review, and week 15, you take one final exam. And that's it. Um, So it was there, was there like kind of going out and having fun and partying and yeah, responsibly. But it was, I mean, you, you you had to actually go to class and pay attention. Yeah. So, it was different. That was good that you were doing it for sure. I remember going into law school thinking, ah, I'm not having anything to drink. Second night, somebody was handing right. me a shot of tequila and that was out the window. You know what I mean? So. Right, right. 
I think you froze a little bit there. Cool. So, uh, the vast majority of us. Am I still here? Yeah, there you go. All right. Can you, you see me? A second. Yep, I can see. Okay. You. So, sorry about that. Uh, the thing is, when you go to law school, the vast majority of first year law students are in their 20s, right? Their early 20s. Yeah. And you're kind of like becoming a young professional and you're in grad school and you're meeting people and it's like, okay, cool. All right. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, all this information at once. It hits you in the face. I gotta really, you know, it, it hits you in the face. face. Like I remember walking through the grocery store the first time, like thinking like how, how time was like the biggest asset. Like if I wanted to finish a project I'd ha at like 10 o'clock at night, I'd have to start at like 11 in the morning. Like I just remembered like how, right. how important time was and the management of time. But so, yeah, so it was intense for you. It was intense. Uh, it was intense time. So like, and you wrote in your lawyer story um, that you were something, and I know you were leading up to a greater point, but being uninteresting, undesirable, unemployable, like for just unemployable you know, after right. you graduated. Yeah. So I went to a small school in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Thomas Cooley Law School, which is now, I think it's called the Western, uh, Western State Michigan University. Um, it has zero affiliation with the University of Michigan, except for the fact that it was located in Ann Arbor about a mile right. and a half down the road. Um, but so it was a it was a no name school. I mean, and that, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but it was a it was a lower tier school. Um, I graduated. I came back to the Philadelphia area. No one knew who Paul Malis was. I didn't know who anybody else was, um, and I couldn't find work. Um, and so. Yeah, I was unemployable. I was undesirable. I didn't go to Drexel or Temple or Penn or any of the Philadelphia schools. Um, and I was uninteresting. I mean, I was I was one of hundreds of lawyers in the Philadelphia area who had just passed the bar exam. And I went to Thomas Cooley Law School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Right, right. So you're freezing up a little bit. Yeah. Well, is that is that your connection? How about now i've got i've got you uh perfectly okay all right um yeah so that makes sense and then you you know you found your calling with criminal defense what was it about criminal defense and all of a sudden you were like whoa this is it yeah yeah and let me just say one other thing too not to knock thomas cooley law school um actually cooley law is the reason why I passed the bar exam, both bar exams. I'm licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Cooley Law is the reason why I passed on the first time. Um, they actually, they teach you how to take the bar exam, um, which is invaluable. And the greatest uh, asset a law student can have is being able to practice taking the bar exam from day one. So, um, so, um, what you asked me, what, what led me to criminal defense? What led me to this path? Why I wanted to yeah. do this? Um, I, my last semester of law school, I did an externship where I moved back home to Bucks County, Pennsylvania, lived at home. And the last semester was done at the Philadelphia district attorney's office as an intern. So I was doing felony preliminary hearings, um, the misdemeanor municipal court trials, the low level stuff, but I was in court every day. And, um, and it was great. And I really just, I like criminal law. Like, I think it's, um, it's intellectual, it's complicated, it's complex, it requires analytical thinking. Um, and so it just, it just clicked for me. And I was, like, this is what I want to do. I want to be a criminal lawyer. Wow, that's amazing. So how did you get hooked? So did you have a couple jobs? Or have you been at um, Young Mar Malice and Associates for a while? Yeah. Yeah. So, so did my externship, um, finished the, that false, I think it was fall semester of 2013, graduated law school in January. While I'm graduating, I'm studying for the bar exam and that's taking place in that February. Um, took the bar exam, passed, got my results in April of 2014. And then was, I, I had worked at a, big personal injury firm in the city um, for like five or six months, didn't want to do it, um, it was grossly underpaid. It just wasn't a good experience for me. And then 
I got a job at the Bucks County District Attorney's Office, which was great. Um, I was I was doing trials. I was in court every single day. I was meeting people, the judges, the other lawyers. Um, and then um, I had left and then got a job um, at, at my current firm um, where I'm at now. That's awesome. So, so yeah. So back to the bar exam. Can you give us some advice? Like maybe, you know, I know you said that Cooley was great with preparing you. And I think that's amazing. Like, could you give... Anybody, I know this is actually, this recording is taking place on bar exam week, I believe. So maybe in the spirit of bar exam oh, week, um, yeah. like, do you have any, uh, or maybe it was last week. I don't know. I'm glad I don't know, actually. So can you uh, yeah. can you give us some advice to somebody taking the bar? Yeah. Well, somebody, yeah. I It's a, a marathon, not a sprint. This is yeah. not an exam that you could just study for in a week or a weekend, like, it takes several months. Um, it's doable. I mean, I always tell people if I could do it, anyone could do it. It's just about putting in the time. Um, I took it l l as if it were a full-time job. Um, all day I took a bar prep course, of course, yeah. everybody does. Um, and just practicing the repetition. It's, it's more about like how to take the test. I mean, it's, it was, what is it like 200 multiple choice questions, yeah. a gazillion essays you have to write. Right. Um, so my advice is just kind of take it slow. Like, you know, it's going to take a couple months of time to like get acclimated and digest the material again and, you know, go through the motions. Yeah, for sure. And so like, what was one of your, uh, you know, you, you talk about the dirty urine case in, uh, in your story. Yeah. So before we move on to like your, your first jury trial, can you tell us a little bit about the dirty urine case? Yeah. So I should actually, so, right. So I had, I should backtrack a little bit. I left the Bucks County DA's office and I got hired by a solo practitioner whose name will remain anonymous in Bucks County um, doing like just a different, I'll just say this, non-criminal work. Um, but, but he was allowing me to do like a little bit of criminal, like he did another area of law and then he allowed me to do some criminal stuff as well, like low level things. So I got this probation violation case and there's this kid, I forget what he was even on probation for. Uh, um, but you know, when you're on probation, you're subject to random um, urine screenings and he was testing dirty on a regular and consistent basis. Yeah. So we go to court and the probation officer is recommending jail time, like 30 or 60 days um, for this like 22 year old young kid who didn't get arrested again, didn't, you know, um, you know, usually we see like, that's a big thing, like a new arrest. He was testing. So we need the kid needed treatment, like some, some sort of treatment. And I just remember like I, the, the anxiety that I had about, you know, going before the judge and making argument. And, you know, I got this kid who's, you know, very upset and his father and they paid me and, and they want a good outcome. And I've got this probation officer telling me, you know, like, no, we're just going to get jail. And, you know, I just spoke from the heart and I went to the gym just how, how wrong it was and give the kid oh. a shot and let him let him get into treatment. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So that worked out. I, I should, that worked out. I should say though, that firm, um, I had, I had, I knew that that was going to not go anywhere and it lasted for about three weeks until I got the phone call um, at my current firm and um, and I started at this firm. Wow, three so weeks, huh? Whoa. About, about three and a half. In yeah. and out, all right. Not a good fit. Yeah, yeah, that happens, you know, like yeah. sometimes just not a good fit of job. So yeah. Um, tell, tell us about your first jury trial. Yeah. So um, as a criminal defense attorney, um, I had a multi-co-defendant case. It was my client and two other defendants. Um, and it was a kidnapping case, witness intimidation, basically like there was this whole separate other case going on and my client and the two other defendants were alleged to have taken the victim in that other case by force and they took him to the police station to write out a statement recanting his, his other statement in the other case. Mm -hmm. um, so that the other case didn't go forward. I mean, it was kind of wild. Um, I mean, there was, you know, it was a kidnapping case. I mean, they took him against his will. They took, walked him into a police station. 
Um, there was a gun involved. Uh, somebody had a knife. Um, wow. So it was like a four. It was, a, it was like a four day jury trial. Um, fortunately for me, like the two other lawyers that were involved, like they were pros. Like they've been doing this for like twenty five years. And yeah. It was it was a good good one for me to you know to to start off with, um, and it was a good case. Wow. So like, do you, do you remember any like specifics about like you know being in court doing your first jury trial like how to talk to the jury or like anything that you learned from that experience? Yeah. I mean, honestly, the way I do it, man, like I I I type it all out. Like I type out my opening statement. I type out my direct examination questions, my cross examination questions. I type out my closing argument. I have a binder um, with all the information, police reports, um, photographs, evidence, my my questions. Um, and by the time we go through trial, like I have it memorized right wow. in my mind. But there is so much time that goes into preparing for a trial. Um, it's unbelievable. People, people that don't do what we do, they'll never understand it. I mean, no, just um, to say, like, say that you, uh, you know, you memorize like what you're writing down. I mean, maybe it's point by point, or do you actually like wrote, is it like rote memorization? No, oh, no, you, you, you practice. Like when okay. I write out an opening and closing statement, I practice, even if I'm just like saying it in my mind or I'm walking around my office, looking at a wall, like I'm practicing it. So I want to hear how it sounds, you know? Um, I want to hear how it sounds while it's coming out of my mouth. What keeps so, you yeah. like inspired to work so hard and do those things? It's the clients, yeah. honestly, it's, it's the clients. Um, yeah, I've represented some pretty bad people like that have done some pretty horrible things. Um, but I have an obligation to do my job. Everybody's entitled to a defense. Yeah. Um, and I like to win. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like I, I really take it to the mat and I'm really, really competitive and, you know, I, I like to have the best argument. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, we talked about, you talked about, you know, you're talking to the wall, you're talking to this one, you're, you're reciting your opening statement, your closing statement. What about um, when things jump up in trial that, you know, I mean, you want to anticipate everybody's move, right? Um, but like, so how do you handle things that like jump up in trial or like, you know, objecting to certain evidence or certain statements? Um, is it more difficult to, or do you just have to master the game? I mean, look, every in life, things are going to pop up, right? I mean, that's just how things happen. Um, they pop up out of nowhere and it's how we deal with them. And um, it's the same thing with court, like things pop up out of nowhere and you got to just know how to act and think on your feet. Um, I had a, a DUI case a couple of years ago, a third offense DUI. He's looking at a, a mandatory one-year prison set, sentence. It's a felony of the third degree. Um, it's prescription medication. Um, and something popped up, like on the the, uh, the blood lab report. And, um, you know, it totally threw us off track. And, I mean, we just kind of dealt with it. So things pop up, and you, you just kind of – you really just learn how to kind of go through it and think on your feet, really. It's just like, just like everyday life, really. Yeah, so – do you have any um, advice for an attorney for speaking in front of a judge? Like, how do you hold your composure? How do you not get nervous? Yeah. I mean, I think with time, it, it kind of just, it comes to you and, you know, you judges. I mean, because I practice in so many different counties, a lot of the times I'm going for a judge for the first time, the second time, and that doesn't know who I am. I think right. the number one, the number one rule is you have to be deferential to the court, you know, yeah. your honor. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You know, you can never go wrong with being polite and respectful. Um, and then, you know, as you get to know who you're talking to on the bench, you get to know that judge's personality, what they like, what right. they don't like, and kind of enables you to do your job more effectively and to speak more more effectively as well do you ever get like comfortable with a certain judge like if you've seen a judge if you've been before a judge like several times is there such a thing as being comfortable in front of a judge or is the judge gonna come out of nowhere and shock you and like put you in prison or something yeah <laughs> you know you know yeah hey it, it happens yeah uh, so, some judges uh you know 
you you go before and you're like, okay, this judge is cool. Like it's gonna be fine. I know I know, I know how it's gonna end up for my client. I know what the judge is gonna look for. Um, and other judges are like, all right, this judge is not gonna be cool. And you know how it's gonna end up for your client, and and it, you're a little bit more timid. And you just have to kind of um, tailor your um, the way you speak and the way you act to the person that you're speaking to, to the judge that you're dealing with. Yeah. So. And so, so going back to, you know, memorizing and repeating and reciting your opening and closing statements, just tell us what it's like, like as a day as a criminal defense attorney. Sure. Well, so you have to, you have to um, be able to keep the business going, right? You got to be able to keep the clients coming in to pay your employees, to pay the bills, to um, to keep things going, to keep yep. the machine oiled. Um, and so like day to day, <clears throat> you're, it's very cyclical. I mean, you're, you're going from court to court to court, county to county to county, judge to judge to judge, client to client to client. Um, and for me, I, I know I can end up in, I'm just speaking about the counties in Philadelphia. So I can end up in Philadelphia County, Chester County, Delaware County, and then end my day in Montgomery County, all for court appearances three, four, five court appearances a day. And while I'm driving, while I'm in the car, I'm answering the phone. You know, the phones are constantly going off. New client, new DUI, you know, um, whatever whatever it is. Um, and so you're, you know, bringing in new business. Wow. Um, and then at nighttime, you're preparing for court for the next day. Or if you're on trial, you're preparing for that trial the next day. Um, so it's, it's very cyclical. Um, yeah, and you're even working on holidays, Paul. Yeah. 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 Most of us are. I mean, you know, you can't, no judge wants to hear, well, you know, it was a holiday or it was you know, my kid's yeah. baseball game. It, it, may, it might be a holiday, but it might be your kid's baseball team, but you got to be able to manage both. Yeah. No, you got to just, you got to just learn how to throw the baseball with one hand and have the phone in the other hand. I, or right, right. Your plug things. You walk around with one. Of those and, I don't have, but and be able, and be able to dictate a, a message to your secretary. You that's know, right. The other side of your mouth. So it's just it's just yeah. multitasking. That's all. That's yeah. all it is. You got a, a lawyer's got a lot of different balls in the air. You got to constantly juggle yeah. things. Uh, so it's it's a balancing act for they've, sure. They've got a lot of pans in the fire, so to speak. Right. There so, are a lot of pans in the fire. Do you did you ever have a mentor, Paul? Yeah, I, I more more than one. Okay. Uh, I would say. Um, so, and I don't want to mention names, um, but That's okay. but I'll just say, um, I had a mentor at the district attorney's office, um, who now actually is a judge. Um, and um, you know, I think having a mentor is great because you're going to learn from that person. Um, they're going to kind of groom you, take you under your sure. you know under your wing. Um, uh, I had, um, uh, the, the owner of our firm, um, Paul Young, he's still my mentor. I mean, awesome. he, you know, he, he, um, you know, it, it's a good thing to have a mentor. It yeah. really is. You know, yeah. You're going to, you're going to learn from that person. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, definitely. How did, <clears throat> did, did your work change at all? Like over COVID, like, were you doing like online, like, uh, trials or like online, uh, you know, hearings, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was awful. You hated, you know, it. Yeah, you hated it. Cause you know, you wanted to. Not, not that I, I didn't really hate, but I mean, nobody knew what the hell they were doing. I mean, like if you had a hearing where there was a stenographer to, you know, transcribe yeah. the, the, the notes and uh, you had uh, a district attorney involved, you had, uh, the judge involved, you had a witness involved, you had me or another lawyer involved, and then there were multiple co defense and one guy's at the jail and the other person's out on bail. You end up with like 15 people on one call, people lose connection, and oh, I mean, it, yeah. it was tough. Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing Florida was like a nightmare, you know, you'd have people like in bed, like taking a hearing, and then people like floating on like a raft in their pool, and like it was, yeah. uh, I don't know. The, the best is, the, the best is like, so you get your client on, you're like, okay, listen, you know, Joe, whatever, your your case is going to be heard by Zoom, you know, we're going to address the court, and the client's username comes on, it's like, 
you know, um, sugar baby daddy. Yeah, 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 I saw those too. Yeah. Like what? Yeah, I definitely, I definitely did see that too. Uh, That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It it was, it was, was, yeah, it was difficult for sure. So Paul, you know, I've read and you're described as a, you know, being a very hard worker and a loyal as an advocate. What does that mean to be a loyal advocate? We already talked about your hard work, you know, with all the, we know you put in a lot of work. I mean, you're, you could hear it in your voice and you're, you know, you've been at this since you were like a kid, you knew what you wanted to do, but what about yeah. being a loyal advocate? Like, what does that mean to you? Um, you have to know, you have to understand that the client comes first, no matter what. I can just tell you right now, I'm dealing with a client um, who's kind of, I don't want to say handed off, you know, I'm, I'm the, the partner in the firm, so nothing's handed off to me, right. but we had a previous, pre- previous associate who was handling a matter who's no longer with us. So I, as a partner, I'd step up and take over that client's case. And the client is extremely difficult to deal with. Mm. Um, and um, despite being unreasonable to deal with, like it's my job to be diligent with the case and, um, you know, be loyal to the client. And, you know, people always say the customer is always right. Well, the same is true with the client. Like, even if the client's wrong and unreasonable and whatever, you got to make it so that the client knows that you're fighting for them. You're doing everything you're going to do to put the client in a better position than the one that they're in. So I think that's what it means to be kind of like a loyal advocate, um, to keep the client in the forefront of your mind at all times. I like that. I think that's so important. Um, so tell us who's coming to uh, Paul Malice at, at uh, Young Mar Malice and Associates. Who's calling your phone with like, what kind of problems are they calling you with? What, everything. What kind of case? Everything? Everything. You name mm-hmm. it. Just before, just before this, I had a CD, just before this, this uh, podcast, I had a CDL driver call me, DUI case. Um, you know, uh, I, I get the whole gambit uh, of cases from the simple shoplifting offenses to the first degree homicide cases wow. to the sex offense cases to the robbery cases. I mean, everything, really. I, I don't, I don't discriminate uh, with any type of case. I take everything. So what's the deal? Like the, you know, the client could tell you whether or not they did it, but as long as they're not, they're, they're not saying like anything that's going to be of imminent harm to somebody, you know, you could kind of keep that in your back pocket, right? Uh, uh, like, like the rules of professional responsibility. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, I'm are, not trying to, yeah, they are. And I'm not, I'm not like kind of laughing. I'm just saying, you know, first of all, no client's going to, very rarely do you get a client who just is like, hey, I, I, I guess you do. Some, some of my clients are like, hey, man, like I messed up. Like you got to get me out of this. But yeah. the vast majority of them like, well, this cop did this and this person did that and I didn't do anything wrong. Right, right. Um, so, so I'll start off by just saying that very few clients are ever like, hey, like I'm guilty. This is what happened. To me, like it doesn't matter what happened. Right? Like I don't care. I just my job is to kind of uh, create muddy mud and, and grayness and smoke and clouds and you know, like reasonable that. doubt, right? Yeah, right. So I got to, I got to sift through the facts and see where the weaknesses are. Um, you know, so I, when a client comes to me, you, you know, and they say like, you know, I messed up or I did wrong or I'm guilty. Like, I think you treat that case a little bit differently than the client who's like, Hey, like I did nothing wrong. We're taking this to the mat. So it just depends who you're t- it just depends on what kind of client you're dealing with. Gotcha. Gotcha. I feel like that's a question I've always like wondered about, you know, but, uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, so one thing that I know is like really important with clients is service, like giving them good service. And, you know, we've talked about being loyalty as an advocate, working hard, like how important it is, is it to you and your firm to, um, provide a high level of service. And I know you've already talked about, um, you know, taking calls on the holidays and like no days off. Tell me about the service at your law firm. Like, 
Yeah, sure. We offer, I like to say, like a special level of service. Um, I have paralegal secretary, receptionist. Um, we have an associate at the firm. Um, I mean, we're a team um, and multidimensional, if you, if I could say that. Um, I mean, everybody's got a different role and that's what makes the team work. So um, when I bring a client on, when a client retains us, they know that they're not just getting Paul Malice, they're getting Paul Malice plus the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, right? The whole team. So um, we really pride ourselves on service. Um, every phone call gets, we have to, I mean, you can't, you can't not return a phone call or an email. Right. Um, so, so we, um, yeah, we pride ourselves on our service. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, what about operations? Is there anything that you do like operationally that's different or like how to, you know, I, I, we have, we talk to a lot of attorneys that talk about having and maintaining systems within the law firm to really make it run. Like what, what are your operations like and what's the importance of having a smooth operation? I think communication. I mean, I hear the word systems thrown around so many times, like every law firm has a system or systems or whatnot. Yep. I, I don't believe it. Just communicate with one another. Yeah. Like my team and I, we communicate on a daily basis before nine o'clock AM we're on the phone for even if just a 10 minute, Hey, like, let's just talk about, did you wrap up what needed to get wrapped up yesterday? Here's what's on the immediate agenda for this morning. And then we talk again, you know, at the end of the day and then throughout the day. So it's just communication. I think that's the name of the system. So what, that, that's how, that's how it's operational. Paul, how, how big is the firm, is your firm? Sure. So, and our firm actually does different areas yeah. of the law. I'm the head of the criminal defense department of our firm. So we have myself, um, my two other partners, and we have an associate. So there are four lawyers and then we have six, seven staff members. So, um, we, you know, my, my department um, is is manned with myself, my one other partner, our associate, a receptionist, and a secretary. So we're 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 manned. I mean, we've got the we've got the um, ability to take on you know people that that come to us. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. That's awesome. Um, so, in reading some about about Paul Malice, I've read that. Um, you know, you, you're helping your clients who've made a mistake, try to live a better life. I mean, that's sort of what it's about for you. You know, you're, you're helping them obviously in court and like trying to get them on the right path. What does it mean to you to like tr be able to um, help your clients that made a mistake lead a better life? Sure. It's actually this morning on my way to court, I got a phone call uh, from a previous client of mine. I vaguely, I, I, I remember him. I don't know if I'd remember. I, I remember him. I remember his name and I remember the fact, it was a gun case in Philly. He had a gun, it wasn't registered to him. It wasn't being used in like a crime or anything. He, just, he shouldn't have had a gun. But anyway, we got his case resolved through a first time offenders program. This was a year ago, maybe like six or seven years ago at this point. Um, and he called me and he's not about a new matter because he completed the, the program that I got him into and he wanted to get the record expunged and, um, which is doable. And we had a nice conversation. He's working at Home Depot now. Um, you know, he's had a consistent job. He's getting married. Um, you, you know, and he must've been like 18 or 19 years old when I represented him. Um, so what's it like? I mean, to think that I made a difference in that young person's life. And when I have clients come to me, yeah, I like to think that, you know, I, I, I can make a difference in their life. You know, like if they have substance abuse issues, mental health issues, like I can get them on the right track. That's awesome. Well, That's huge. Yeah. Somebody called you today before the this call morning. Hey, hey, my life's in the right place. Like I'm at uh, the depot, like, you know, 
working in the hammer department or whatever they're doing, you know, that's whatever really, he's doing. That's really cool, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. They, they remember you, you know, you have like a big impact on these people. Especially I, right. when you're trying to better their lives. That's like a big deal. It was a really good feeling. It's like, he remembers me. Like I, you know, I've had hundreds of clients since him and like, Hey, but I, I, you know, I remember him and he was a nice guy. So I like to think I do have, do make an impact while at the same time protecting their rights in their case and defending their case. I yeah, also want to, I also want to be impactful in their, their personal life. Absolutely. So, so Paul, tell us like what the significance is of knowing the facts, the law and the judge. Like, what if you can't know the judge or what if you don't have a lot of the facts or what if you're, you know, the law is not so clear. What is, is, it, have, is it good to have all three? Does it, well, it depends. Does it have to be in that order? Like, do you need to know the judge first, then the facts, then the law, or the law, the judge, the facts? No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just being funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be. Uh, <laughs> all right. It's, you got to know, like, what you're dealing with when you walk into court. Like no judge, some lawyers have bad reputations because they, they're not familiar with the, the facts of their client's case, which is just unacceptable yep. on so many different levels, or they're not really familiar with the law. I'm in the middle of a, a huge case right now. Again, I'm not going to mention like county or names or anything like that, but it's multi-co-defendant. It's a very, very, very serious case. And the one lawyer just clearly is doing his client a disservice, like, Anoint, not familiar with the motion, the law on the motions that he's filing. The judge is like kind of talking behind the lawyer's back, saying like this guy's waiting it over his head. Like that's the absolute last thing that you want is wow. a judge to be like, "Wow, you, you know this lawyer is like over their head today." You got to be familiar with, um, you know, all of it, like the the facts of your client's case. Um, you got to be familiar with, you know, the law obviously and how it operates and you got to, you know, be familiar with like what the judge likes and dislikes, you know, does this, what time does this judge come out? Nine, nine 30, you know, does this judge like you to submit pre-trial memorandum, you know, you know, pri at a certain date, like you got to know it all. Basically. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Oh, that sucks. That the this guy's over, the lawyer, and over his head and he's like, oh, geez. Yeah. The lawyer, it's it just, that's the absolute last thing that I ever want is a judge to be like, Paul Malice is in over his head on case. Like, no, I want a judge to say this case should go to Paul Malice because it's really, really complicated. Right. You know, right. And, and th that's how I want to be perceived. And that's how I think, quite frankly, I think that's how I am perceived. That's great. Most of the judges. Um, so it's important to know all three things, though. Very, very important. That's great. So, Paul, give us some last advice on trial preparation. Give us some tips. Not the bar exam. No more bar exam tips. All right. No, we, we've no. talked about the bar. <laughs> no more bar exam, please. Uh, okay. No more bar exam. Uh, trial tips. Um, you you got to know your case like down cold. Like you got to know your theory of the case. You got to know what the witnesses are going to say. You got to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, and you got you got to know the law. Um, you, you have to know all of it, um, and it, it's really uh, it's really challenging. I mean, I, I mean, it's just my partner's in the, in, in trial right now in a, a sex offense case. I'll say, and um, there's like pre, all these pre-trial motions and stuff. A, a lawyer learns as the lawyer goes. Right. You know, there's there's issues that come up and you got to research. You got to be able to research. You got to be able to write in order to frame what the legal issues are and present it to a judge. Um, so I think to sum it up, but the advice that I would give is you got to be prepared. You know, you got it. You got totally. you, you got to be prepared. Totally. Did you have more advice for bar exam? No, I was just. I was, I mean, All right. the, the, la the last thing that I would say about that is be, you never want to take the bar exam twice. So just do yeah. everything you can to, to make sure it doesn't happen. You don't want to, but some people do. Some people do. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, Paul, what else did we leave out? Do you want to talk about anything else? Um, 
No, I, I think I think we covered a lot of it. I think we covered a lot. Yeah. Uh, Paul Malice doing criminal defense there in the Philly yeah. area. Uh, partners, yeah. your partner, Young Mar Malice and Associates. You even got your name on the letterhead. That's pretty sweet. I got it on the letterhead in the door. It's in the it's door to be that's, up in the door. That's amazing. That's unbelievable. It's good. And you're yeah. in different locations, right? The firms in different places. Different yeah, places. we're our main office is in Ben Salem, Bucks County, but we're in. We have multiple offices. So, wicked cool. Yeah, so yeah. Thank, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate. Well, thanks it. for having me. And yeah, uh, yeah for sure. Uh, stay right there. And uh, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Wherever you are on the world today, enjoy yourselves.